Good afternoon, and welcome to BWI Talks, Island SOS. I'm William Campbell, your host for today's presentation. This eight-part series focuses on innovative, sustainable ocean development initiatives undertaken in island nations around the globe. And each presentation will cover a different island and a different topic. It will highlight the unique perspective and involvement that islands have on ocean conservation, and it will showcase the different practices that islands have been undertaking to safeguard their surrounding ocean. BWI appreciates the exclusive sponsorship of Chubb Bermuda, the sponsor of this series. Island SOS aligns with Chubb's goal and their mission to promote a healthy and sustainable planet, to strengthen the resilience of communities, and to protect biodiversity against the effects of climate change. This presentation today is the seventh in our series for this year and the 15th overall, and it will focus on the sustainable ocean strategies undertaken in the Falkland Islands by the uh, South Atlantic Environmental uh, Research Institute, or SERI, and the work of uh, Paul Brickle, who I will be introducing to present his talk. Please join me in welcoming Paul. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, it's uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Paul. Very, very interested to hear uh, hear what uh, Sari does and uh, hear more about your work in, in the Falkland Islands. I'm um, just wondering as well, if just to open us up, if, uh, if you would let us know just who you are, uh, what kind of work you do with Sari, and if you could tell us just a little bit about the Falkland Islands uh, too. And over to you, Sir. Thank sure, you. absolutely. Um, so um, I'm a quantitative marine ecologist um, and the CEO here at Sari. Um, so I drive a desk most of the time, um, but uh, I probably have one of the best jobs in the world because I get to still engage with science as well as uh, um, building building a research institute. A little bit about the Falkland Islands, we're at 52 degrees south, um, so it's winter at the moment. In fact, uh, um, I'm in a nice warm office, it's snowing outside, um, or was. Um, and uh, yeah, we're a, an island nation um, like Bermuda. We have uh, 778 islands in the archipelago. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, very, very complex place in terms of its environment. Um, and we are probably truly, I would say truly subantarctic. Um, we have a lot of subantarctic species here um, and we live in very, very productive waters. Wonderful, Paul. And if you wouldn't mind just uh, telling us a little bit more uh, about yourself and I will uh, turn over the floor for you for your uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, a, I'm a quantitative uh, marine ecologist. Um, I have a slide actually in a bit um, about uh, just a little bit of background about me. Um, I worked on uh, um, a large Antarctic fish species called the Patagonian toothfish. Um, with, and I did my PhD at the University of uh, Aberdeen. Many of you will know um, the, uh, the, the toothfish is Chilean sea bass. Um, and is uh, perhaps one of the most uh, um, expensive fish in the world. I'll come on to that in a sec, um, but uh, my, my talk is uh, structured uh, as, as it says on this slide here. So a little bit about me, a brief introduction to Sari, um, some background and some introduction to the Falkland Islands marine environment. And then um, I'd like to talk about uh, our marine protected areas journey here in the Falkland Islands. And what the next steps are um, um, for those. Um, the the picture to to the right there, um, they're, they're called lobster krill, um, also known as whale food. They're highly abundant, hundreds of thousands of tons inshore, um, and just about every predator um, that inhabits the Falkland Islands at different times of its life history will feed on this at some point. Um, and uh, sometimes, as you're flying over the islands, you can see shoals of red, almost blood red in the water, and these are um, shoaling uh, lobster krill. Um, Carla's driving my slides today, so thank you very much, Carla. Can we shift on to the next one? Just a, a little bit about myself. Um, um, my background is quantitative marine ecology, meaning um, I use numbers and models to, to understand marine ecosystems and community ecology. My PhD was uh, on the Patagonian toothfish, as I mentioned earlier. And the picture on the right here shows a Patagonian toothfish um, at about 2,000 meters depth um, next to an autonomous camera lander, um, which is baited. You might be able to see um, on the cross there some squid. Um, Patagonian toothfish get up to about two meters in length and can weigh um, 100 kilos and a little bit more and live up to about 60, 60 years. Um, 
known as white gold because they're highly prized, very expensive, um, and you find them in um, top-end restaurants around the world. Um, I think also sold as Chilean sea bass in the States and, and many other places. So some of you may have uh, may have a chance to eat eat uh, eat the fish. A lot of a lot of these uh, come from very sustainable fisheries now. Um, it did have a bit of a check in the past. So after my PhD, um, um, after working around the subantarctic, <coughs> which was quite an adventure, I started off as a fisheries. I started off as a fisheries scientist uh, in the Falklands Government Fisheries Department, where I was responsible for a number of fin fish species in terms of their stock assessments, um, population dynamics, <coughs> excuse me, um, their ecology, and so on. Um, also co-founded with a, with a friend and colleague, the Shallow Marine Surveys Group, um, which uh, is, is an exploration group essentially, um, and we do coastal um, subtitle surveys around the South Atlantic from South Georgia, um, obviously around the Falkland Islands, um, um, around Centralina, Ascension, and also into the Caribbean. So uh, we get to get to go on some quite exciting expeditions. As mentioned, I'm the Chief Executive Officer here at SARI. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And as you can see, I've got a wide range of interests. So I sort of consider myself more of a jack of all trade, trades and a, and a master of none. Um, Carla, can we go on to the next slide, please? Um, just um, a little bit about SARI. Um, people have talked about a research institute in the Falkland Islands for many years. Um, it's always had lots of scientists passing through. Um, mainly as a staging post and mobilizing to uh, places like South Georgia, which you can see on the map uh, on the right, um, and also to the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, so, the, so, the, so the Falkland Islands kind of missed out um, in terms of science, but we have uh, an incredible environment um, and one that's important for studying sort of regional and global science. Um, so quite important and the, and, and the government recognized this. Um, and more latterly, in 2008, started discussing this under an economic development strategy. And the sort of premise and, and the logic there um, was that, uh, um, you know, if you had a coordinated mechanism to allow scientists to do their science in particular environments in the Falkland Islands, they would spend money in hotels, and rent vehicles, um, rent guides, and, and so on. And then, of course, as an institute grew um, and was formed, it would uh, apply for grants, employ employ staff who would pay tax <coughs> and so on um, in, in the islands. Um, so so uh, um, the government uh, um, set, set Sari up in, in 2012 and that's when I started. And uh, next slide, slide please, uh, Carla. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we we set we've set up in 2012, but we split from Falkland Islands government in 2017, and and the reason for that is donors um, prefer to give to private organisations rather than governments, and this is always the government's intention uh, to split us off. We're um, a registered charity in England and Wales, and also on the local charities register, and we have uh, offices here, as you can see in this picture, um, in, in in the Falkland Islands and Stanley. Um, we also have an office in London, Santalina, uh, Turks and Caicos, um, Anguilla and, and Namibia, um, of all places. So um, we're expanding um, also out of the South Atlantic, as you can see, with, uh, with the work we do in the Caribbean, which is great. Next slide, please, uh, Carla. So um, this is uh, um, just a little bit about our vision and mission. Um, our vision is to deliver world-class environmental research. Uh, from the Falkland Islands that informs uh, effective stewardship of our planet. And you can see our mission there. I won't read it out for you. Um, picture on, on the right uh, shows a white Bunodactis anemone and a beaded sea star, um, which are quite common um, in our coastal seas. Um, thank you, Carla. Next slide, please. Um, we have uh, three focal areas, and the glue that holds those together is our um, information management system, as a data management system, and the GIS uh, center. Um, and we do a lot of work in ecosystems. Um, we also do a fair bit in, in remote sensing, and that's using satellite imagery, uh, as well as as well as uh, smaller um, 
autonomous um, um, autonomous uh, craft like drones. Um, and we also um, um, work in, in the marine sciences area as well, particularly around paleoecology to do with peat and sediments. Um, thanks, Carla. Next, next slide. Um, this just shows you where we work. Um, so we'll skip over this just to, just to keep on um, on time. I've mentioned most of these places, and uh, and uh, I'll tell you now briefly uh, about Falkland Islands uh, uh, marine environment. So just to give you some geographical perspective here, we're about 800 nautical miles <coughs> north of the um, Antarctic Peninsula, um, 800 nautical miles um, west of South Georgia. Um, and then 400 uh, nautical miles from the coast of South America. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. Um, we have uh, an EZ, which are actually called conservation zones. So the one at the top and the one around the uh, around the east there is called the Falkland Islands Outer Conservation Zone, and then the one to the west is the um, Interim Conservation Zone, which is actually 150 nautical miles in a circle around the geographic center. Um, of uh, of the islands and of course we border Argentina uh, to the west um, there. Um, next slide please. Um, this is a uh, uh, chlorophyll A um, plot of uh, the marine environment around the Falkland Islands just showing productivity um, and the, it's part of the large Patagonian large uh, marine ecosystem one of the most productive uh, uh, regions on the planet and and testament to that productivity um, are the globally important seabird species we have here marine mammal species of course and major fish and squid stocks um, which sustain the economies I'll, I'll come on to um, in, a, in a little bit um, and of course a lot of unknowns like many other overseas territories uh, this is still an area of discovery in terms of uh, biodiversity and, and, uh, and, and environment uh, next slide please uh, um, so we'll flick through a couple of images here to give you a sense of what our what our environment looks like. This is uh, um, um, black-browed albatross. We have 75% uh, of the global population here in the Falkland Islands, and all feeding on this productivity. Greater than 50% of uh, southern um, South American fur seals, um, um, which uh, which are also uh, really interesting, and we study those quite a bit. This is a southern right whale. They come here to breed. Um, and feed, and then they move further north up the coast of Argentina to, to, to calf and, and so on. Um, in penguins, we have five species of penguin uh, here um, in the Falkland Islands, um, and a number of them are globally important. Um, this is a king penguin, which uh, many of you might have, uh, have seen uh, on uh, some wildlife documentaries around South Georgia. They're much more. Uh, have a greater population down there. This is uh, Gentoo. We have the large, one of the largest populations in the world there too. Um, and just some uh, a few stats about the marine environment uh, um, here in the Falkland Islands in terms of uh, its its contribution to our economy. Um, commercial fisheries, as I said, is, is incredibly important, um, and um, is about fifty percent of our total total GDP. And then we also have a large cruise ship tourism um, that come to see this bountiful uh, wildlife. Um, and that, that's, that amounts to about 10, 10 to 20 percent of our GDP. So greater than 60 percent of our long term uh, economy relies on the sustainable management of our seas. Um, there, there, there has been some oil exploration here and, and we have do have potential for rich oil fields. So there has been a couple of periods. Uh, um, in, in our history where, where where these have been explored and that wax and wanes depending on on, on the global economy um, and also our coasts are really important to, to our population um, if, uh, we have many settlements on the coasts um, and a lot of people use the coast for all sorts of things recreational activities uh, sustainable fishing um, and so on so uh, these have to be taken into account as well um, so on to, on to the next slide. Um, it's just a, a bit of a background, really, on, on some of the fisheries. This 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 example is the Falklands calamari. It's uh, our biggest domestic stock, um, up to eighty thousand tons a year. 
Um, and the picture on, on the left here shows two Loligo factory trawlers, um, two, two calamari trawlers. And they'll go out to sea, fill up um, and process their catch on board and blast freeze it in freezer holds up to about 600 tons per vessel. Then they'll come in and transship. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and of course, because we, um, you know, harvest uh, marine products from our seas, we also need to make sure they're harvested sustainability. So a lot of money is, is brought back into into uh, into research. And this uh, just shows a picture of uh, our research vessel from, from the back end of the bridge there, and a couple of us um, working on some fin fish um, in 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 the processing area of, of, uh, the, of the factory. A couple of shots below just show the surface oceanography um, during that particular survey, actually. Um, um, and uh, on to marine managed areas. So there are three phases here. Um, and first of all, we, we really did need to see how um, man and beast utilize the seascape. Um, so we had to gather this information. Um, and of course, um, we started this off um, with uh, creating a toolbox for marine spatial planning. Um, and if you think of marine spatial planning as like planning um, in, in an urban sense, um, what we do here is, is map how um, map activities um, in, in the marine space um, and then layer them on top of each other. And when you get overlapping activities, there's a, there's a potential for conflict. And of course, that's where the planning comes in. Um, and needs to be managed. But I'll focus more on the sort of biodiversity and environmental side of this. Um, so in order to, to justify protected areas with a large complex stakeholder environment, you need evidence. And of course, so we mapped um, um, how um, animals and humans and plants and biodiversity use, um, use the marine space um, around the Falkland Islands. Um, and, and this is really truly a, a stakeholder driven process without um, the support of stakeholders um, who work in these different sectors, it, it would be impossible to, to move forward with uh, you know, marine protected areas and so on. So um, through various workshops, we, we consolidated a sort of a joint vision for MSP right across a bunch of stakeholders. And that's, uh, that's uh, um, outlined here below. Um, ensuring well-managed marine coastal areas and resources in the fault lines for sustainable economic development whilst protecting our biodiversity and wild unspoilt area, spoilt areas and supporting the safe use of the sea and celebrating our maritime heritage. As you can see, it's quite a lot in there because people wanted to get their say. Um, thank you, Carla. Next slide. Um, and mapping our marine environment is very important. So we created uh, a a big GIS um, database, which you can see here. And we also created um, a web GIS, which if you click again, color, um, and this web GIS allows um, our decision makers, um, if you click one more time, that's it, um, allows our decision makers to, to view um, these quite complex data in, in more simplified forms. Um, and of course, visualizing data is really important. Uh, um, to understand it, but also important for decision making too. We go on to the next slide, please, Carla. So uh, a couple of examples of, of some of the products that came out of this exercise. So um, this uh, little um, plot um, at the top there with the ships um, just shows a date taken from one year um, from AIS data, which is a uh, um, satellite derived uh, um, VHF uh, data from ships. Um, it gives you a position, um, and uh, we're allowed to. We, we this enable us to map the movement of cargo ships, old tankers, and cruise ships uh, around around the islands. One thing that uh, really actually astounded us with oil tankers is not shown in this particular figure for that year, is how close they were coming to the northwest of the island, where our biggest albatross colonies and biggest uh, wildlife spots were. Um, the figure at the bottom is. Uh, um, a juvenile elephant seal. Um, as you know, they get very large um, and males can get up to about two and a half tons. Um, and the figure to the um, right here just shows the important megafauna areas, which is a, a mix of uh, seabirds and seals. Uh, next, next slide, please. So on to the second part of our 
main protected areas journey um, was something called AFCAS, which was assessment of fishing closed areas. Um, and what we did was look at areas that were closed sort of permanently, semi-permanently or, or temporarily sort of. Uh, um, so we have some areas that are closed because fish spawn in those areas at a particular time of year and so on. Um, and then we measured those against some um, set criteria that uh, um, um, we had come up with uh, through consultation uh, to see um, whether they would be, uh, uh, you know, sort of appropriate as protected areas. And uh, a number of them dropped out um, uh, as appropriate. That's our inshore areas here, as you can see on this map, and also further south uh, to the Birdwood Bank. Um, and this was delivered through um, a consultation, a workshop, um, and then a post-consultation workshop. Um, and it was at that post-consultation workshop that we agreed that some further work needed to be done, um, so we could uh, so we could sort of better manage these uh, areas in future. So if you go on to the next slide, please, uh, Carla. Thank you. Um, and this is uh, stage three, um, and this this was uh, a Darwin-funded project called Fine Scaling: The Design of uh, Falkland Islands um, Marine Managed Areas. Um, and there were six uh, um, steps identified that were required for designation. I'm going to stick to the um, baseline data um, elements to this, um, number one. Um, the picture here on the right is a naked urchin. And if you look really closely, if, if, if uh, your resolution on your screen is good enough, you can see some bands on the plates between the spines. And those bands are laid down annually, so you can probably age it. Um, on to the next one, please, Carla. Um, so, um, in able to better understand the environment here, uh, particularly our baseline environment, uh, um, we need to look at our inshore, offshore environments and also our higher predators, um, particularly within these areas, but also more generally for future um, potential des designations for protected areas after, after this. Uh, next uh, slide, please, Carla. Um, just a little bit about kelp forests. I won't spend too long on this. There's a lot of text here. Kelp forests are a bit like coral reefs and mangroves. They uh, protect the environment from storm damage. Um, uh, kelp forests are really important for nutrient cycling. They provide nursery grounds for commercial fisheries um, and also for tourism. Um, I mean, uh, this is this is also really important. Uh, we did a study on on kelp forests. Uh, to try and estimate what they provide in terms of goods and services, ecosystem services, and, and also their potential for blue carbon. When we added all of this together and quantified it uh, um, in terms of economic or financial terms, this equated to about 2.69 billion pounds a year, or um, if you take it per kilometer squared, 3.24. Um, so healthy kelp systems are really key in terms of supplying valuable ecological processes and ecosystem function um, anywhere. Um, and they're really important to, to our inshore and offshore areas. Next slide, uh, please, Carla. Um, and, and just a few slides really on how we went about uh, exploring some of these areas. So in our inshore areas, we um, used uh, um, yachts like this. This is the Golden Fleece, um, and it allowed us to get to some far-flung places around the island, and as you can appreciate, uh, um, an island of 778 islands, uh, sorry, an archipelago of 778 islands, uh, you need a ship to get around or a, or a small vessel to get around. Um, next slide, please. Um, we developed camera systems to get to deeper waters um, um, outside of scuba depth, and, and if you go on to the next slide, and of course we did a lot of scuba diving. Um, it's a bit colder here than it is in Bermuda. Um, at the moment, it's about four degrees. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. A couple of pictures here. This is Darwin's nudibranch on the left. Um, and, uh, this is probably the only nudibranch that Darwin talked about uh, um, during his voyage of discovery on the Beagle. Um, these two are getting quite intimate with each other. Um, and the picture on, on, on the right um, there is uh, a colonial sea square called Stiella and a common common sea star. Next slide, please. Uh, um, we also found new habitats. So um, these are corals um, 
in really shallow water. Um, normally, this, this type of coral will be found in deep water, hundreds of thousands of meters. Um, and because it's on uh, and in an area where we get a lot of upwelling, we, we get a sort of uh, something called deep water emergence, where we find deep water species shallower. Um, next slide, please. Also found merl beds. Um, these are calcareous nodules um, that are full of carbon, but also provide um, um, incredible habitat for, for a lot of other critters that uh, we're still studying. Next slide, please. I'm going to speed up a little bit uh, now, Carla, because I, I realize I'm on 25 minutes now. Um, one unique thing about the Falkland Islands coastal uh, environment is, is we were ice free at the last ice age, which meant none of our biodiversity or very few of our biodiversity were scraped off the sides. Um, and um, we have much greater diversity than we do on, on, on sun, in Southern South America, um, the Antarctic Peninsula and South Georgia. If you go to the next slide, you can see this um, in a richness curve at the top left, where um, um, the green one is, is the Falkland Islands, and it's very steep. Um, it's much steeper than the others. And if you look at the bottom, you can see a relationship between um, the age at which these, these regions were ice-free and their diversity too. You can see the fault lines is, is, is quite high up um, there in terms of diversity. So if we go on to the next slide, please. Um, just a, a few, a few, few, few comments on on uh, our offshore um, um, deep water vulnerable marine ecosystems. So we looked at these um, by using drop-down cameras, um, ROV footage, and so on, and then we're able to model um, the distribution of these um, through through some modelling. Um, procedures called uh, maximum entropy. Um, if you flick through to the next slide, you'll see a number of different groups. So these are hard corals, gorgonians, lace corals, and so on and so forth. Um, next slide, please, Carla. Um, and also to access these offshore areas, you need a big ocean going research vessel. Um, and here we use the RSS James Clark Ross British Research, uh, British Antarctic Re Survey Research Vessel. It's now um, owned by by the um, Ukrainian Antarctic uh, Survey, um, and this just shows a, a sort of benthic uh, dredge that they used to, to sample bottom and very deep areas. Um, yeah, if we just flick through these couple of slides, and I'll, I'll move on to. Um, the high predators. Um, we also need to understand how our high predators move around uh, up this space as well. Um, so we do this with GPS tags um, and satellite tags, and you can see a number of different devices here. And this is what happens. This is the results we get. If you go on to the next slide. Thank you, Carla. Um, <laughs> yeah, tang <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> A tangled mess of spaghetti, and how do we make sense of this? So we do a lot of modelling to to bring this into something that's a little bit more unique, meaningful and, and, and something we can understand. If we go on to the next slide. Um, so um, we bring this into into a lot of mod a modelling exercise, something called kernel density analysis or estimation, um, and it allows us to overlap um, the number of species to see where these important areas are. Um, and then on to the next slide, please. Uh, also, um, this is the last sort of technical part of the talk, uh, um, is understanding ecosystem function. And, and uh, we are doing this through looking at uh, uh, physiological experiments for key species that are important to the ecosystem. You see a little squid at the bottom there, um, an amphipod in a, in a, a respiratory chamber, um, to try and understand the winners and losers in the climate race. And if we go on to the next slide, this information goes into um, an ecosystem model, a dynamic ecosystem model. And, it, and once we've created this model, it allows us um, to modify it to see what consequences are of, of, of uh, say, uh, a, a species declining um, due, to, due to climate because it has rather narrow thermal tolerances. It can also be used for ecosystem-based approaches to fisheries management and see the consequences of fishing at a particular level within the system. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, so that that was it in a in a nutshell in terms of our marine protected areas journey. We still got a few more steps uh, to go, um, and the government are undertaking a finer scale policy formulation exercise at the moment, which will lead on to legislative drafting and then hopefully designation um, within the next year, which would be fantastic. 
However, there are still baseline gaps to fill, um, and we also need research and monitoring plans, which will feed into um, the government's management plans. So we're developing uh, more grants right now to to fill in some of these gaps. Um, and then the next slide, please. Um, that's what they look like, about 50% of our areas. The greens are national marine nature reserves and the blues are uh, sustainable mixed uh, zone, multi-use zones. Um, this will be the, the precursor to potentially other designations in the future and, and sort of sets the path for that, which is, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and then I think I'm on to my final soft slide, uh, Colin. Oh, one, one before that, just a, a shout out for um, um, some some sponsors and so on. So funded by a number of people, including Paul M. Ankel, John Element, Darwin Initiative, uh, Falkland Islands Government, uh, Falkland Islands uh, Fisheries, Cup Fishing Companies Association, Oregon State uh, University, Shadow Marine Service, Good British Antarctic Survey, and all of these people were part of uh, part of this work. So um, thanks to them. And then uh, over to you for any questions. And uh, um, thank you very much for allowing me to talk. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm sure all of us uh, who are watching can learn uh, an absolute lot from uh, all of the research and, and the knowledge that you guys are gathering down there. Um, I just had a couple of questions as well, um, and hopefully we'll have a couple other uh, ones from the audience. Uh, you had mentioned uh, early on um, in the talk the importance of uh, the primary product uh, productive species of krill. Um, in terms of uh, what you explored later in the uh, in the talk um, around uh, dependency of other species on those, um, is do you have any insights uh, as to what the future might look like in terms of uh, primary productivity uh, impacts and what other uh, impacts I might have further down the food chain? Um, so, so we're doing a piece of work uh, on that at the moment. Um, so um, you saw the physiological experiments uh, on that slide that I put up. So we're, we're looking specifically at, uh, at lobster krill. Um, they are uh, a keystone species um, here in the Falkland Islands. Um, so they will have a, a very large impact um, um, on the rest of the ecosystem if, if uh, their po populations and abundances uh, decline. We um, and and as well, uh, I I noticed that you had mentioned that there there were a lot of sustainable species uh, that you had mentioned, but that there had been somewhat of a checkered past in terms of uh, marine protection and sustainability for them. I was wondering if you could just tell us so, a little bit more. About that, yeah, sure. That that was that was on the Patagonian toothfish. Um, when the fishery first started in sort of late eighties, early nineties, there was a lot of uh, IUU fishing, illegal, unregulated fishing. Uh, and uh, this this has become a lot uh, a lot better regulated now. Um, uh, and and in fact, many 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 fisheries have uh, an MSC certification, which is the gold standard um, for for sustainability, which is great. But in the past, they, they did have a bit of a checkered history in certain regions. And as well, uh, with with the mapping of of cruise ships and oil tankers as well that pass by the Falkland Islands. Um, what other impacts of, of oil exploration and uh, particularly tourism too uh, have there been on uh, on marine protection? Um, so um, the oil industry not, not much actually because uh, we've we've only had one real exploration round, um, and it's just one field that people are looking at at the moment. Um, so, so we we don't have an oil industry. It's there's some exploration going on. There has been some exploration going on. And there, there possibly will be some more exploration going on in the near future. And is there is there anything more specific as well that you've noticed in terms of uh, cruise ship activity or tourist activity on the marine protected area? Um, so um, we we have a large number of tourists a year, and the, the ones that come in and um, sort of go go into some of, go around some of our islands here tend to be small expedition ships, um, so small numbers of people. We we will have a, a challenge, I think, um, particularly with the sort of uh, tracking south of avian influenza, which you've no doubt heard about. Um, of course, we have globally important seabird populations and so on. And of course, uh, if we have an outbreak in a particular colony, we want to try and minimise um, the spread of the spread of that across across the island. So there'd have to be some management uh, this season coming up, I should, uh, for sure. 
and as well uh, for for um, population collapse. Um, what are your biggest concerns for impacts on species uh, in the future, and what what things should other islands be paying attention to in that regard? Um, so, in terms of population collapse, do, 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 do which which species do you, do you mean? Um, as just, a, uh, generally. As a general oversight, uh, particularly with with examples of alien uh, or avian influenza, pardon me, um, and even as a as a recent example, uh, the collapse of some emperor penguin uh, colonies in in the in the Antarctic. Are there any other general uh, points of concern that you would want to highlight for other islands? Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, I think avian influenza this season is going to be the major concern and worry. Um, it's already in southern South America, um, we believe. Um, and it's sort of transferred across to, to other species outside of birds, um, including seals and so on. So um, it is a concern and something that's, that the government uh, um, with, with, its, with its stakeholders and partners will have to work on uh, very closely. Um, it's, yeah, no, and, I, and I, I think we're quite lucky here in terms of um, we're a small population. Um, we have a small government. People work very closely together. Decision made, decisions are made quite quickly. Um, I, I suppose it's similar in, in Bermuda too. Um, so you can can react quite quickly than, than perhaps larger organizers, larger uh, larger governments, and so on. And you'd mentioned as well that uh, commercial fishing uh, makes up uh, maybe fifty to sixty percent of the uh, Falkland Islands uh, GDP. Um, with the strengthening of marine, marine protected areas and with uh, and, and with monitoring. Do you think that that is going to be a sustainable industry for Falkland Islands Preserve uh, 20 and 30 years into the future? Um, yeah, we hope so. Um, we're quite proud of our fisheries here. Um, we have, uh, you know, sort of some of them are MSE certified, as, as I mentioned. MSE is the Marine Stewardship Council certification process. Um, and it's seen as the gold standard in sustainable fisheries. Our calamari fishery, which uh, I showed you a picture of uh, some squid uh, earlier on, uh, that's managed in real time, uh, literally in real time. Um, data comes off the vessels with observers on, um, and we have stock assessment scientists uh, working working on those daily, um, looking at depletion and things like that. So uh, knowing when to close the fishery early or, or extend it and so on. So, so yeah, real time weather. Is, very proud of those. And is, is the research work that you're uh, engaged with conducted year round or are there any other challenges uh, that you to highlight to your research work? Um, it's, it's a challenging environment to work in. Um, and uh, we, it, is the, it is the furious 50s. You know, it, we have the Southern Hemisphere westerly wind belt. It's always windy. So we've always got choppy seas. But uh, as you will have seen from some of the maps, we have uh, quite a large coastline. And, uh, you know, we can always find a bit of a lee somewhere, um, as they can operate in, in quite in quite harsh conditions. But uh, yeah, we're very big on health and safety. Uh, that's really important to us um, to make sure our staff operate sa as safely as they can, in, whether they're working on the sea or, or sort of uh, on the land. As and as a final note as well, and a last question, um, Paul, are there any uh, major points around uh, climate change as well and impacts on the Falklands and on commercial fisheries? And on island conservation as a uh, as a general oversight that you'd like to give. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mentioned we're, we're currently working on a project um, that is, is assessing exactly that. Um, we have projections, obviously, from you know IPCC. However, the Falkland Islands are situated in uh, in an odd point on the globe. Um, they're quite next to South America with, with uh, the Andes disrupt that flow. So those general predictions aren't necessarily going to hold true. They might be slightly nuanced here. Um, we seem to be having a, a drying um, terrestrial environment, which causes challenges for biodiversity, but also for things like farming. Um, and that's being looked into um, at the moment as well. Um, I think the important thing from us and any, and any small island really is, is to learn how to become resilient to these things and to adapt. Um, climate change is happening. Um, it's how you manage your environment um, to the best um, of your abilities to sustain it um, in, in, in something that's changing. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for your insights and for the presentation that you've shared with us today. Um, it is Absolutely, our hope that uh, your presentation will inspire further discussion and uh, action on, on uh, marine protection 
and environmental stewardship, not just in the Falkland Islands, but in island nations around the globe. Brilliant. Well, well thank you all very much. And thank you, Carla, for helping with the slides. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Paul. And we'll look forward to, uh, to seeing you again very soon. We'd also like to uh, give a thank you to Chubb Bermuda, the sponsor of the BWI Talks Island SOS series. And you can check out the entire BWI uh, Island SOS Talks series on the BWI YouTube channel and on the CITV Bermuda channel as well. I'm William Campbell, and I look forward to sharing more exciting BWI initiatives with you in the future and hope you'll join us again next, uh, next uh, or sorry, this coming October for the first Sunday in the month where we will invite all of our uh, environmental stewards back again to share us some updates on the work that they've been undertaking in the months since.